Jeremy Hindle, you're nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Production Design for a Contemporary Program for uh, Severance for the first episode, uh, Good News About Hell, uh, that sets the tone for all the strangeness to come. Uh, what did you think about just the concept when you first read the scripts? I mean, it's uh, the script, honestly, it was, Ben sent it to me first and I kind of, I read it. Um, I wasn't that, it, it's amazing. The writing's amazing, but it, it wasn't like a visual language to the show. And I, and I, I, what I love was that I know Ben is quite visual. So I thought I put a lookbook together for him and we met three days later and I kind of had just an idea of what I, how I thought the show could look. And I, we met and I showed it to him because I wanted to make sure that it's what I would want to do and what he would want to do. And it was pretty um, adventurous. And he was, we were both just clicked. Like we totally clicked into how far we could push it. But it was the strangest show because there, it's not like anything anyone's ever seen. And it wasn't, finding the tone for the show was, you know, it's an office environment. It read like an office show. It read like the office, but it was, the writing was strange and the environments were, you know, hinted at, but it wasn't, it really needed a world of its own to um, kind of take us on this journey with these people. Like, and how, what, what we learned over, you know, the first few months was that there, you know, this company is experimenting on the people and it kind of gave me, I realized that I could experiment on them. You know, everything is sort of designed and manipulated for them. They're children, basically, they're birthed into this, this office space. So, and once I realized that I could be the person, this kind of godlike creature too, that could actually come up with things to play with them, play with the actors and make them, put them in places that were uncomfortable or interesting or surreal. And really what we learned quickly was the scale was gonna be what the show was about. It had to be like, like the MDR room was, had to be the most, you know, we're gonna be in it for three hours the first season. So it had to be tonally, and scale-wise, the most interesting room that it would feel like surveillance, but it's not surveillance. We really want to be with them. We want to interact with them. They are children-like, so it had this like childlike kind of feel to their desk area where they could play with it a little bit. Um, it was it was kind of an adventure for. It's the most collaborative I've ever been to work with, like Ben and the writer and just the DP. Like the four of us really clicked, and we really push each other in every way. Like we take. Dan's script and we all have tons of opinions and Dan writes with our opinions and our ideas and we all kind of um, amalgamate to it's, it was such a fun process but chaotic for the first season for a lot of people because we didn't really know what the show was going to look like till it was cut like it was pretty strange and the uh, the offices have kind of this futuristic feel but also kind of this retro feel at the same time uh, what were some of the inspirations and references you used for it? I mean, the, the, the reason I kind of, intentionally, I thought, if we're in this environment and you're underground and, and it's designed to be the perfect workspace, I thought, let's just go back to when the perfect workspace existed, like 50s, 60s. And it really was, to me, was always Kevin um, Kevin Roche and Eero Saarinen had, had done this John Deere office. Like John Deere tractors had the most beautiful offices you've ever seen. And so it was like, that's kind of should be our look like. It's the perfect desk. It's the perfect pen, the perfect Rolodex, the perfect phone. There's no personal, you know, before human resources took over the office and said, bring your family, sit here for 14 hours a day, bring your plants, bring your, you know, your life. It was just work. So it felt like, okay, if that's what people are going back to, this is the environment. It should have that same killer look and feel to it. That's super professional and stunning to look at. And then when we, when the show, when I came to New York, I live in LA, um, I quickly, someone showed me, you know, I, I knew the Bell Labs, which was the same designers as John Deere, like with Saarinen and, and Kevin Roche. And it be, I always thought it was condemned. It was like closed down for 20 years. It was defunct, but someone had just finished restoring it. So we approached them, we went to see it and, can, you know, and we kind of made a collaboration with them that we could be the first people to shoot the building. Because what we really wanted to do is everything in the show had to be unseen. It was something we can't, this can't be a world that anyone knows. It can't be a location that anyone's ever seen before. And it happened to fall in our laps. There was the same designers, same concept. So the exterior and that front entrance is in our same language. And it's just, it's funny how you put something into the world and things come back to you at the same time. Like you put out what you want and things do come together and it's amazing. Like we had um, this is luck and, and opportunity at the same time. 
Uh, and, and tell me about creating all those maze-like corridors. Like, how do you create that sense of, of endlessness and, and kind of that winding? There are so many hallways. It's insane. Like, it's, your band wanted to do like a two-minute walk. And um, it's, it's basically every set was designed, like, we, we designed every set and how much stage space we had. And we built hallways. It's like a maze all the way around and around and around and around. And the key is that when you first come off this narrow elevator into this little lobby area, the first hallways are like a certain width and then they get a little bit wider as you progress they get wider so that when you get to the crossroads that it feels wider that you're like okay now where do i go because in dan's head the writer this goes for miles underground like miles you know so for the seasons ahead it's a it's it's like a city underground there's so much going on um but it was it was basically you know, it's, what's interesting about the narrowness is they all have to walk sort of single file at first, and then when they come to the crossroads, they can kind of walk four abreast, like they're all kind of there together. Like you feel them kind of team building together, which is fun. And uh, of course, there's the world of the Lumen offices, and then there's the world of the Audis, the, their lives on the outside world. Uh, what visual similarities and differences did you want to bring to that other, you know, half of their lives? I mean, I guess the, the key for us was that we didn't really ever want to know what the time period was. Like the, everything underground, the computers were our own look because Lumen would design everything and it would be in their own. So if you ever came out into the real world, it wouldn't make any sense. But also when we, when we got into the outside world, we we're like, you know, the cars, um, we wanted everyone to live in sort of Frank Lloyd Wright-ish houses in Pleasantville. And it was still to have a really nice design element to um, the show, but also just like the, the, the colors would be the, the key change. It would be like warm. There'd be a fireplace. There would be, you know, there's no, in underground, it's always white, blue, green. And the only new colors would come from wardrobe. Like, they're, you know, Hallie might introduce a new color in her wardrobe. And then in the outside world, it would just be just enough that it was like comfortable enough to feel warm. Um, and just, just, just a slight contrast to the inside. And always winter because we still wanted to keep the white look. It's it's always about a little having enough white in the show. Uh, and the the macro data refinement office is uh, you know one of the most important locations on the show, and it's uh, especially unsettling because you have that gigantic room, that green carpet, and that little workstation for four people. Uh, how how uh, what, what were the kind of considerations that went into into that and how that looked? I mean, when Dan yeah. wrote it, Dan wrote, you know, four desks, large room, and which was great. It was like, okay, large room, I love that. Um, and I, what I really was always fascinated was having the, a really low ceiling. I think it's seven feet, nine inches. It's really, like John Turturro's six, five. It's really low. And um, the key was to really make it feel claustrophobic, but also spacious. It's, it's really unsettling when you're in it. And it's also really enhances, I think, performances. It makes people feel uncomfortable because it is uncomfortable, but it's also the, the key, like the green is like, it's kind of like grass, like a playground. You know, the, the, the four consoles is basically, it's like it's on one post centered in the middle suspended that it's kind of like the umbilical cord of all this math that they're playing with the numbers that it all comes, it was underground to whatever, because they're, they're doing something on these numbers that control something underground. So it's like, this is what, this is where the information comes from and this is where it goes. And then I, we've all shot a million offices and their dividers are always a nightmare because they kill eye lines and they're just, so I was like, what if they can, what if they can play with them? What if they can just manipulate it with one finger up and down? And when I knew John Tatura was in there, I thought this, I know he would, this was going to be amazing. And of course he's the one that does it. And um, it was trying to create an environment that because we were in it for so long, that it was, it had to be, the show had to be playful. Like you ever seen the movie Playtime? Jacques Tati, like it's it's all set since this really fantastical 60s film. And we based a lot of the concept on it should the show should be playful. These people are being they're being experimented on, they're they're playing with their characters, they're playing with their humanity. So we were like at the same time, it gave me the gift to play with them in every way possible, which was what can I do to make things fun for them at the same time? Like, what, the, what are they doing here? Uh, well, I want to congratulate you on the show and the, uh, you know, the the unique world that you created, and uh, congratulations on your uh, your Emmy nomination. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks so much.